What a year it's been. What an amazing year it's been. God has called us from all of the difficulties of the last 13 months and invited us into the presence of joy and mercy and grace. Let's pray. Father, it is so hard for us to understand being loved as we do because giving love is not one of our best things either. So this morning, Help us to feel your presence so that you might change us. Let us worship you so that we might learn how to serve. Let us accept you accepting us because it changes how we see ourselves and other people. We pray for these blessings and worship in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> goes on 
dying without the Savior's love, and we're just playing games at the foot of the cross, so close to a struggle. Yet so far from the cost, never feeling the shame, and never sensing the loss. We're just playing games at the foot of the the foot of the cross. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we have we've longed for and prayed for and beseeched you to give us this time we're beginning to encounter. And I don't know if we know how to do this part. Some of us don't know how to stop that embarrassing, but when is it going to be my turn when we see other people get vaccinations or you're not going to make me do that? I don't know how to wait well. I don't know how not to have it all sort of like five minutes before recess. I'm just itchy and I don't know how to behave anymore. I also don't know how to do the next part after we start getting safer. How am I going to stop fearing human bodies and thinking they're going to be a danger to us? How will we find the energy and the security to show up to with each other once again. Lord, I, I'm not even sure that we can do small talk right this second. And more importantly, what will I judge others for when I can no longer judge them for not wearing masks? I'm sure I'll find out something. And for that, I need your forgiveness. Father, gently remind me that a year ago, I didn't know how to live through the evaporation of all of our plans our chances for worship, holding hands, the death of loved ones, social turmoil, and the end of vacations and isolation that, frankly, we weren't sure we could bear a lot longer. I did not know how I was going to live without traveling to see my kids and grandkids and the sacraments and movie theaters and hugging people just because they needed to be hugged. And yet somehow I did get through that. But I don't want to do it any longer, neither does anyone else. Lord, we need full healing and wholeness so that we can again be together. We confess that that's critical to us. And we beseech you for that. Help me to remember that somehow we did get through this year without first knowing how we would do it. And that you have been in every single moment already and you will continue to be in every single moment. So I thank you that you are somehow my somehow. That your sweet Holy Spirit has been with each one of us and equipped us and comforted us even when we fail to notice it. And believe it or not, even fail to realize how grateful we should be. So we confess that as this last year has taught us so much, it has led us into ways that could hurt our witness and our unity. So forgive us and restore us and renew us, O Holy Spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I know this will come as a shock to many of you, but I am not reading from the Sermon on the Mount this morning. Instead, I'm going to be in the 19th chapter of Luke. Luke's account of Jesus' entry and what we call Palm Sunday, or the triumphal entry. After Jesus had been teaching his disciples, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just tell them, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, his owners asked them, why are you untying this colt? And they said, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus. They threw down their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the ground. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of the Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, even the stones and rocks will cry out. And as he approached over Jerusalem, this is the part we seldom read on Palm Sunday when I was growing up. As they approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. He said, if you, even you, had known, only known on this day what would bring you peace, but you choose to have it hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when enemies will build an embankment against you, encircle you, and hem you in on every side. They will dash you down to the ground and your children within the walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You did not recognize the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. May God bless to us this reading from his word. This is the word of the living God. The one who saves us and redeems us because God chooses to do it. We're going to turn to, in our hymnal, 296, I think that is, right? Yeah. That's correct. It is called Hosanna. <clears throat> songs is a song I first learned when my children's choir in Maryland, the Young Spirits and Joyful Sounds sang this song in his time. And I think especially at Easter, it's really a special um, thought. In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful in his time. 
Lord, please show me every day as you're teaching me your way that you do just what you say in your time. So I know what some of you are thinking. That didn't sound like much of a Palm Sunday special music you were singing, Bill. What's that cross stuff? Well, yeah, what is that cross stuff? Here we go. It is Palm Sunday. And when I was a kid, it was just Palm Sunday, as you heard. Uh, actually, unless you were listening to a podcast you haven't heard. My first Monday, Thursday service uh, occurred when I was in the fifth grade. I'd never heard of such a thing. But back then, we would go to Monday, Thursday, the night, Thursday night before Easter, to remember the time that Jesus started, instituted the Lord's Supper, and we would observe that. And then the next day, we would go to Good Friday services. Later, as an adult, we would participate in community Good Friday services where we carry the cross, literally carry the cross from place to place in the city where we knew that God's justice and mercy was not being shown. And now we sort of call it uh, Palm, Sa Palm Sunday or Palm Slash Passion Sunday because we sort of know you're cheating. Uh, this year, we're not sure if we're going to be able to do Monday, Thursday or not. We're certainly praying and seriously considering. 
But even when we did, we knew that the whole community was not coming, and Good Friday services are pretty much passe. So we were going from singing Hosanna to glory to God for coming through all of this week and being resurrected on Easter without going through the horrifying crucifying stuff on Good Friday. So Palm Sunday became Palm slash Passion Sunday. And that way we made sure people at least heard a few of the scriptures about the beating and the torture and the spitting and the denial and the betrayal and the suffering death of Jesus of Nazareth. And I understand that. I much rather go from glory to glory instead of have to go through all that downer stuff. And, and you know, it seems reasonable that everyone would like to go from praising God to that big experience of the parade from the empty tomb where the disciples and the women left and said, I know something has happened. That way we don't have to think about the uncomfortable things like uh, Jesus eating his last meal with the people he loved most. And of course, they were going to betray him, maybe like me. And they would deny him. These friends, maybe just like me. And maybe they wouldn't even be able to stay awake while he prayed in the garden. I'm sure I probably wouldn't have. And we don't have to hear about that crowd, perhaps like me, that would strike and taunt him for not living up to their expectations. And that some of the people would, maybe even like me, cry, crucify him. And twist the crown of thorns that passerbys like me would say, for heaven's sake, save yourself, because... I know I would have tried to save myself. And the fact is, it does seem at times, if you look at it objectively, that Jesus got himself killed in a totally preventable way, never once showing enough self-respect to fight back or get himself off that cross. I've heard people say, you know, maybe he had it coming. And I was taught as a young person growing up as a Christian that the cross was all about the fact that God had to take his only son and send him to suffer and die a horrible death because I'm mad. I mean, those times I, I hit my sister, the, the times I talked back to my parents, well, God had to kill his own son because of me. And there were times when I wondered why God would get so angry that he would kill his own son like that because the sins I committed back then, they weren't grown-up sins yet. It didn't really seem proportionate. And I think that is when I began to question who this Jesus was for me personally. Because I'm not sure what's worse about the things I was taught, that God was bloodthirsty or that he was some angry loan shark that needed his pound of flesh because of the stuff I had done. And that's why Palm Sunday is a great representation of what it means to get Jesus right and to get Jesus wrong. Because the crowd on what we call Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, they were saying all the right things. Hosanna. Praise God for the one who has come. Bless him who's cometh to bring us salvation. Go back with me. Jesus has healed blind Bartimaeus. Has taught the disciples and others about the importance of forgiveness. And then he says, let's go to Jerusalem. Now, this is not like getting in the car and driving to Jerusalem. They start at Jericho, which is actually the lowest city in the world, at least a thousand feet below sea level. And for the next seven hours, approximately, he would have climbed up what Luke calls a hill, but I promise you what I would call a mount, the Mount of Olives, we call it today. It was a, he was going up about 3,200 feet, straight up. No expressway. And Jesus has done something interesting throughout his whole ministry. Whenever someone 
sees him do a miracle and says, you must be the son of God. He says, shh, 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 don't, don't tell anybody. Or he heals someone and says, don't tell anyone what I've done. Or he exercises demons or he profounds, performs a, a profound time of preaching. And people want to cry out, you are the Messiah. He says, shh, shh, no, 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 don't, don't say anything until today. He knew the teaching of Zechariah. Zechariah said that one would come who would be riding in on a donkey, actually on the colt of a donkey, and he will come and he will bring peace both to Israel and to the entire world. And Jesus was surrounded by people who wanted him to be the Messiah. They were ready for him to be the Messiah, but they were ready for him to be the Messiah who was going to bring about vengeance on all of those who had put Israel down who were oppressing them even that day till they get near the top of the Mount of Olives and Jesus stops and says, go get me a colt. Now Matthew sort of makes it sound like Jesus is riding a donkey and a colt, but what Zechariah says, he's gonna come in riding a, a donkey and then he clarifies and says, it's really gonna be a colt. In other words, it's gonna be a baby donkey. And when they, are confronted by someone who says, why are you taking this cult? They're gonna say, the master needs it and he'll bring it back, don't worry. And so they bring it to Jesus and they put their cloaks on Jesus. And this is not a majestic moment, okay? Let's assume that Jesus was short like I am. If you put me on a baby donkey, my robe and my feet are gonna be dragging the ground. Imagine the presidential, um, What's the word I'm looking for, Ray? All of those cars, caravan, caravan, presidential caravan. I knew there was a word there made up of 71 pintos. Everybody's trying to squeeze in. Maybe the, the president's arm is hanging out because the secret service are pushing in the other way. That's how ludicrous this was. This was not a moment of majesty. This was a moment of parody. Because the crowd is looking for a Messiah who's gonna come in and kick out the Romans. They're looking for someone who's going to come and be a political and military might, who's going to make Israel the new Roman Empire. And Jesus does everything Zechariah prophesied. He looks ludicrous on a baby donkey. As the crowd around him doesn't seem to pick up on it, they put their cloaks down on the ground in front of this animal, sort of like a, a red carpet procession. And they take out palm branches or they take them off of trees and they begin to wave them. This is like waving American flags at a military parade because the palm front has often been a symbol of Israel. And when Judas Maccabeus, Judas the hammer, that's what back at Maccabeus means. When Judas the hammer led a revolt that pushed the Greeks out of Israel 200 years before. They had started waving those palm fronds when he came into Jerusalem. And so this was sort of a way of saying, USA, USA, except it was Israel, Israel. And Jesus crest over here. Can you see, imagine, you, 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 you've been around hills right here. You come over the hill, you come over the mountain, and you look down, every picture you've ever seen in Jerusalem is probably taken from the Mount of Olives, looking down on the city. And Jesus weeps. If you knew, if even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but because of what you believe is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within the walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's choosing. They were praising Jesus in the right way. 
He is the Messiah, but for the absolute wrong reason. They wanted a king who was going to be victorious, who was going to bring revenge, who would practice violence upon violence. And God says, even in Zechariah, those aren't the games I play. I have come to bring peace, not war. I'm the God who comes and restores things to peace. And the weird thing about this is if Jesus had stopped right that second and turned to the Pharisees and said, hey guys, you know the words of the Lord. You are the Puritans of the day. You are the right-wing Bible believers and making sure everyone does the right thing. Ask, let me ask you something. Do you think that what Zechariah said about the Messiah coming in on the cult is um, the word of God? And they said, well, yeah. But that's not for today. Hold this in. Because if this gets too big a crowd, too exorbitant a crowd, the Romans are going to fight. If you turn to the high priests in the Sanhedrin, because after this moment, you never see the Pharisees again in the Gospels. It's now the religious rulers. Don't you think this is what Zechariah was teaching? They say, yeah, yeah, but not now. And they would continue to be collaborators with the empire of the world because they wanted their political power. And Jesus weeps because they want something other than the Prince of Peace. And so because of that, they're going to eat the portion of war. Let me read this passage to you again, and I'm going to do it in a modern retelling. When you see soldiers camped all around Jerusalem, then you'll know that she's about to be devastated. You'll be living in Judea at the time. Run for the hills. If you're in the city, get out quickly. If you're out in the fields, don't even go home to get your coat. This is the day of reckoning. Jesus is not talking about the second coming. Everything written about it will be coming to a head. Pregnant and nursing mothers will have an especially hard, incredible misery, torrential rage, people dropping like flies, people being dragged off to prisons, Jerusalem under the boot of the barbarians until the nations finish what was given them to do. Have you ever heard of a town called Pella? In 66 AD, the Jews finally got what they wanted. A person who said, I'm going to be Judas, Judas Maccabeus 2.0. I will lead a rebellion. And starting in Caesarea Philippi, they revolted against the Romans. And the Roman Empire said, that's it. And they began to crush the rebellion. And then Caesar sent in the 10th legion. And as this army of might came in, the Jews said, what can we do to save ourselves? Well, let's go to Jerusalem because that's God's city. God would never let anything happen to Jerusalem, obviously not paying to what happened, paying attention to what happened in the Old Testament. Over a million people inside Jerusalem, according to one of the generals, a historian, Josephus. And for months they laid siege and Jerusalem became a place of starvation, cannibalism, people fighting each other. Everyone who tried to escape Jerusalem, who was caught, was crucified right outside of Jerusalem. Imagine a city being surrounded by rotting corpses. So that sounds like what Jesus is describing. Catapults raining stones down on the people in Jerusalem and killing them. We're told that over a million people died. And the 100,000 that survived were the ones who built the Colosseum in Rome. And the Romans took the walls apart of Jerusalem and they literally took the temple apart, stone by stone, as Jesus prophesied, and they dragged them out into the desert away from Jerusalem so it could not be rebuilt. We have to recognize what kind of Jesus is. Jesus was not going to be the new Pharaoh they wanted or the Joshua who would conquer the promised land or the great mighty King David because that's not who Jesus is. He's not Judas Maccabeus. He's the Prince of Peace. And then in one of the great ironic moments, Judas talks to the Jews who were there outside Jesus' trial. By the way, do you know that Barabbas had a, a first name. 
It was Jesus. His last name means son of the father. So here is what Pilate said to that crowd that morning. Hey, you tell me who to release. Do you want Jesus, the son of the father, or you want Jesus of Nazareth? Well, Jesus of Nazareth wasn't going to do anything. And Jesus Barabbas was a national hero. He was a freedom fighter. He had led a revolt that had led to the death of Roman soldiers. That's why he was offered execution. We'll take the freedom fighter, crucify that Jesus, other Jesus. They cheered Jesus the right way, but for all the wrong reasons. And that's why they rejected him. Because Jesus wasn't giving them what they wanted. See, the king approaches on Palm Sunday. He was forsaking that glorious war horse by riding that conic little donkey, that colt. Forsaking that glorious horse for the ridiculous peace donkey. Inaugurating a, a reign of love. They say Genghis Khan killed over a million men. We certainly know how many Hitler and Mussolini and Hirohito caused to die in their wars. If the hosannas that cry out praise the rocket's red glare, we need to weep over Jerusalem. And if the hosannas that cry out today acclaim God's kingdom, even the rocks and stones will cry out and join us. See, we need a whole new way of being human, and that is becoming the human being that God created us to be. Because by ourselves, we're stunningly violent. We are capable of Cain killing Abel and Auschwitz and Hiroshima and Sandy Hook Elementary School and the nickel mine school massacre we talked about last week, that, that's easy to us. Living in peace is not. And every time we try to reduce Jesus to be the ticket into heaven, but not anything to do about peace here on earth, all we do is feed into any narrative that makes Jesus what we want him to be in the meantime. And I don't think that's who God is. But I do think this whole mess is about what we get when we try to divorce the cross and the resurrection from God. You see, that's not about us. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, in fact, even recently, and I listened to a lot of sermons, people say, you know, the cross is all about us. No, it's not, it's all about God. God is not standing up there in heaven with his arms folded, looking down in judgment, judging us and punishing Jesus. See, God isn't standing above the cross. Jesus is God. Say that with me. Jesus is God. God is like Jesus. Jesus is like the Sermon on the Mount. We've been working on that one. But remember, Jesus is God. God is not standing over the cross. In judgment, God is hanging from the cross. And I think our problem starts when we think that we know who God is just by knowing that we're pretty vengeful and we're into getting back and payback and assuming God is like that. That's why it's hard for us to imagine God pouring all of his being into the cross because we never do anything like that. The good news is there is a reliable way to legitimately know about the nature of God. And it's never to look at ourselves, it's to always look at Jesus. Remember, God is like Jesus. So if you want to know what God is like, don't look at us, don't look at the church, look at Jesus. Jesus is God coming to earth and saying, this is how I want to be known. Not with armies, not with swords, not with slogans, as a servant seeking peace. I 
On the cross, we don't see a legal transaction. I've heard that so many times, it makes me want to just shake my head in, in despair. It's not a legal transaction where Jesus pays our debt. That's, that's God there. The word of God made flesh hanging from a cross because God is basically saying, I would rather die than to be in the sin accounting business anymore. God hangs from the cross and no one escapes his judgment. Those who betray him, those who execute him, those who love him, those who ignore him, he judges all of us. And here is the pronouncement of judgment from God. You wanna know about the judgment of God? Here it is. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. And that is an eternally valid statement. Let me say that again. The judgment of God is this. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And that is an eternally valid statement. From his cross, Jesus is forgiving the betrayer, the violent, the God killer, and all of us. Despite our protests, he's not going to even lift a single finger to condemn us, those of us who put him there. Because basically when it comes down to God is not like us, we have a God who enters our human existence and suffers our insults. And he does it with love and for forgiveness that can save us from ourselves. It's only a self-emptying God that Paul talks about that can put aside all glory, empties himself even to the point of cross on a death, even to the point of death on a cross. Because that's the only thing that can save us. In fact, I'll say I believe with all my heart that it's only through the cross that we know that God isn't standing smugly at a distance judging sheep and goats but that God's abundant grace is hidden in and under all of this broken stuff that we call us. Because while suffering and dying on the cross, Jesus says, it's not about you, it's for you. You wanna understand that you're forgiven? If I tell you that, you mutter. A man is brought to him who can't walk. Jesus forgives his sins. And the, the religious leaders say, well, how can you do that? Jesus, let me ask you, what's easier, to forgive sins or make someone get up and walk? And their answer is, of course, make someone walk. Loved ones, he dies on the cross to help us understand we are forgiven. God is so in favor of you. There is no place God will not go to be with you. Nothing separates us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not insults, not betrayal, not suffering, not even his death. So we don't go to glory to glory and skip Passion Week, not as long as I can preach. Because Christ's broken and blessed body is the one certainty that helps me to know God is for us. Always for us. And so as you enter into this week, do so in the company of self-emptying God. A God who pours out everything that could be made special about him so he becomes a human being. And saves you with a relentless, terrifying love will ultimately enter the grave and the very stench of death in order to say here, right now, I can't stand the thought of being without you. Hosanna, absolutely. Save us right now. We don't want the eagles perched on Roman posts, as Jesus prophesied, ready to eat the carcasses. No, no, no. Jesus said, you don't have to do that. I have come to bring peace. Peace among you and peace with God. We need to be right about Jesus as well as right about what we say about Jesus. Hosanna in the highest indeed. Welcome to Holy Week.
we will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Alleluia to the King of Kings, Alleluia to the Lamb, Alleluia to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Alleluia to the King of Kings, Alleluia to One of the problems with the way we look at the Bible is we sometimes take it verse by verse by verse and forget the context. And sometimes I think even on Holy Week, we do it day by day and forget the context. Here it is. The Prince of Peace has come, whether you want to call him that or not. The Prince of Peace has come and has instituted a meal so that we can always remember that we are forgiven. He proves it on the cross, not that he has come to us, but that he is for us. And the cross and the resurrection, God vindicates everything Jesus said and did. What an amazing week of worship. And there's a slight chance we might even be worshiping together next week. We're prayerfully considering what is safe for us and, and for everyone in our community. So I ask your guidance for that as well. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and in the life everlasting. Your sins have been absolved. Go in the joy of the loving, forgiving Lord.